I forgot to hit record. There we go. So prayer, we're going to look at it as it pertains to evangelism, spiritual warfare, and the sovereignty of God. That's what we're going to look at today. And so we all know this passage. It's a famous passage, right? Matthew 28, 19 through 20. It says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. And that's our mission here at Providence. We don't have a big fancy written out mission statement. We just go by what scripture says. That day may come where we sit down and we come up with a, you know, an official mission statement. I don't think we're gonna say it any better than Jesus, <laughs> right? Yeah. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Yeah. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Jesus says to go out into all the world Guess what? For us, it starts here at Providence, the community, Warren County, and out from there. And Lord willing, by his grace and mercy, we will have an impact, right? As we grow, we'll be able to do more things for the kingdom of God and reach more people and see more people get saved. That's our mission here at Providence. So we need to understand a couple of things about prayer. Because prayer is something, none of that's going to happen without prayer. Did you hear what I just said? None of it's going to happen without prayer. And I'm sad and brokenhearted to say this, and this message may sting a little bit. It stung me pretty bad when I was preparing for it. Just know that I love you and my intent is not to offend anybody or hurt anybody's feelings, right? Y'all know how much I love you. But hear me, we don't pray like we should. Yeah. Notice I said we. I said we. I'm preaching to myself. We do not pray like we should. Let me explain what I mean by that. We got to have a proper perspective of prayer, what it is and what it's for. There's two things we're going to be talking about today. I'm only going to cover the first. Next week, we'll deal with the second. Here's those two things we need to understand about prayer. Life is spiritual warfare. Life is war. We have to understand that. It's absolutely crucial. The second thing we're going to cover next week is the sovereignty of God. So the two things put together, life is warfare, spiritual warfare every day. The second thing is the part that the sovereignty of God plays in all of it. How does that relate? So years ago, I read a book. I need to share what inspired me. Years ago, I read a book called Desiring God. And it just completely changed my outlook on the Christian life and what it means to be a Christian. The whole thing is so saturated with scripture. Um, you could probably, if you didn't have a copy of the Bible and all you had was the book Desiring God, you'd, you'd be doing pretty good. <laughs> it's got so much scripture in it. And the author backed everything he said with scripture. And then this week as I was praying and studying like where we were going to go and what we needed to talk about, I, I believe I was led to another article that just reinforced what kept playing through my mind about prayer and about spiritual warfare. So I'm going to share with you, uh, in my own words, I'm going to share with you some things uh, that I learned, one, primarily from scripture Two, from the commentary of this man on scripture. Does that make sense? So life is spiritual warfare. If you want people to pray, you have to help them understand why it's so important. Right? We got to understand why it's so important. 
You're going to hear me say it over and over again. Life is spiritual warfare. That's why it's so important. Life is war. And the stakes are infinitely higher than anything happening on earth today. We got wars happening today all over the world. Pick one. Right? We got people that are up to no good all over the world today. Pick a situation. Just turn on the news. Right? Those things are scary. But it's not what's most important. Do you know what is? Human souls. Souls are at stake. Souls are at stake. It's not just about losing territory or one uh, country invading another country. It's about souls. It's about souls. So how does the Son of God factor in here? The sovereignty of God, I'm sorry. How does the sovereignty of God factor in and why is it so important? I'm going to tell you why. Could you really have confidence that God's going to win the war if he's not sovereign? If God is not sovereign, can we really have confidence that he's going to win the war like he says he's going to? It is critical to understand life is war and the sovereignty of God factors in in that way. What will that do for our prayer lives if we understand the sovereignty of God over all things? When God says, this is what you're supposed to do during this time and this is how it's all gonna end up. We can have confidence in that. We can believe in what God says. We can have faith and trust in God's word. So if God's not sovereign, our prayers are going to be weak. If we don't believe that God is sovereign, our prayers are going to be weak. Well, God, I hope you can do this. As opposed to God, I know you are going to do this. I know you're going to do this. It's not a matter of, well, if you can or if you want to or if you don't mind. You look at God's word and what his word says. You say, God, I know you are going to do exactly what you said you're going to do. We don't need weak prayers. They're not going to do us any good. Understand, life is war. As a Christian, you're going you're gonna to be in a fight every day of your life from the time you wake up to the time you lay your head down on the bed. We are to be engaged in spiritual warfare. So let's look at this verse again. 2 Timothy 4, verse 7, where Paul, he's at the end of his life. He says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race I have kept the faith. So how does Paul describe his life here? He describes his life as a fight. That's the word he uses. He describes his life as a fight. He's at the end of his life and he says the whole thing was war. Spiritual warfare. And we're, we're looking, if you know anything about Paul, you're looking at a man who suffered greatly to advance the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why should we think we're going to get out of that? <laughs> amen? Only, only a couple amens to that. I know, it's scary. No Christian is going to make it through life without a fight. No Christian is going to make it through life without a fight. It is a lifelong battle. And think about who the enemies are. Think about who our enemies are. The world, the flesh, and who else? The devil. The world, the flesh, and the devil are our enemies. Do you think they're taking it easy on us? Do you think they're, you really think they're not sneaking around or just blatantly outright trying to hurt us and our families? That's a battle every day, folks. The world, the flesh, and the devil. 
They don't want you to finish well. The enemies of our soul, they don't want us to finish well. Endurance is of utmost importance in the Christian life. Endurance. We can't even do that without God's help. You want to talk about the importance of prayer? Try fighting the world, the flesh, and the devil in your own power. It's not going to, ha it's, it's not going to be good. It's not going to work out for you. Mark 13, 13. And you will be hated for, uh, for all. You will be hated by all for my namesake. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. The one who endures till the end will be saved. And make no mistake about it, like I've already said, we can't even do that without God's help. We can't endure to the end without God's help. Prayer, life is war, the sovereignty of God. This is so important, guys, and we have to get this right. By God's grace, may we get it right. Now look at this. Paul says this, so I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air. Paul's just not kind of floating through his Christian life willy nilly, right? Just kind of relaxing. You know, you go to work, you go to church, whatever. You sit down, eat your food in front of the TV. That's not what Paul's life was like. So Paul basically is saying here very much so the discipline, control. And he says, uh, if you read a little further, so his preaching isn't disqualified, right? And it, it, this is very simple. And a lot of you know the old saying, you got to practice what you preach, right? What's another saying? Put your money where your mouth is. I don't want to hear you talk to me about Jesus unless you look like him. Right? If I can see the impact that Christ has had in your life, and I can tell you're a disciple by the way that you live for him and for others, huh, I'll listen then, right? So Paul is basically saying here, he wants to live a disciplined, controlled life for the glory of God, so his preaching isn't disqualified. And then if we look also at 2 Corinthians uh, 10 3 he says this for though we walk in the flesh we are not waging war according to the flesh so you know what that tells me the way Christians are supposed to fight is different than how the world fights right the world doesn't rely on God for the fight Christians can't and they do, and they should. So Paul describes his life and ministry using the terms of war. We are not waging war. So there's another wartime term. For Paul, success in the Christian life and in ministry was to be a successful soldier. You ever think of yourself as a soldier? Isn't there an old hymn that we used to sing, Onward, Christian Soldiers? Right? Life is war. And if you're a Christian, you were recruited for war. You're recruited to serve in that fight. We have got to have a wartime mentality. We have got to have a wartime mentality. If we turn to Ephesians chapter 6, it's a very familiar passage. We just talked about it last week as well. We are to dress in the armor of God every day, ready for battle. This is a reality. It's got to be a way of life. And sadly, not many people live this way. Are you with me? Nobody's falling asleep. Sadly, not a lot of people live this way. You don't have to raise your hands, but how many of us wake up every morning and the first thing we do is talk to our father and get dressed in the armor? 
How many of us do that? God's given us everything we need. Everything we need for spiritual battle, for war. And we don't come to him and prepare for battle. You know, this is, this is why we make so little impact on our communities. This is why we make so little impact on our country and our world because we don't see the truth that life is war, life is spiritual warfare. We just don't get it. Nobody lives like we're at war. Most people in America live like it's peacetime. And this may, this may hurt a little. Most people live like it's peacetime. And here it comes. We're more concerned about our comforts and securities than anything else. We're more concerned about our comforts and securities. And if you're in a war, if you understand that this is spiritual warfare all day long, every day of your life here on earth, if you get that, wartime changes everything. Wartime changes everything. I want us to think about World War II just as an illustration, okay? When you're at wartime, when it's war, the media covers it. You'll see it on TV. You'll hear it on the radio, podcasts. It'll be all over social media. The newspapers, everywhere, it's gonna talk about the war. It's gonna give us updates on troops. How are the troops doing? How many died that day, right? How many died? It's going to tell us about progress. Did we win this battle? There's families that are going to talk about family members that aren't there and may never be there again. It's wartime. It's wartime. And as I'm writing this in, in my outline and I'm praying and preparing for this, I keep thinking about lost loved ones. Lost loved ones. Families talk about family members that aren't present and may never be there again. How we spend our money is affected when it's wartime. You don't go out and buy certain things that you're thinking about getting. You say, what's more important, me having this or winning this war. Souls are at stake. In wartime, the civilians are armed. In, in World War II, I can't remember exactly, uh, I just remembered this. In World War II, when the Japanese were fixing to invade, they were talking about invading America and one of the generals, if I'm not mistaken, told them in the war room as they were preparing, it's a bad idea to invade America. And they said, why? And they said, there's going to be an armed civilian behind every blade of grass. What if the enemy felt that way about Providence Baptist Church? Huh? Yeah. What if the enemy was like, you can try to invade that church, but God has really got them protected because they're praying. They understand they got to have a wartime mentality. They're using prayer as it was intended. We're going to get there. It's interesting how wartime changes things. Um, somebody said this too about this particular topic. Cruise ships built for luxury in World War II carried troops. Luxury liners like, you know, uh, oh, what are some of the cruise lines of today? Like the big cruise lines. Could you imagine if we were at war and it was so serious that our big cruise ships for vacations and luxury and stuff like that were actually transporting thousands and thousands of soldiers where they needed to go? This is the kind of mentality we need to have. 
People's lives are at stake. And why is the war we fight so much more serious than any other earthly war? Who's our enemy? You think Hitler was bad? What about Satan? Some people are going to watch this on YouTube and they're going to make fun of that. Ooh, Satan. You think of the church lady, right? From Saturday Night Live from years ago. Our enemy's real. And if you think it's funny, he's got you. If you think Satan's a joke, you're in trouble. Satan's impact is global. Certain wars that happen in the world today are in certain countries and locations, right? The war we wage against the enemy of our souls is a global war. And I'll tell you what, you're at risk of losing more than just body parts. When I was working in Murfreesboro at an office, I met a friend there who was a Iraqi war uh, veteran. And he had his leg blown off by a, uh, by a bomb. And uh, <clears throat> I just remember getting, in, I think the world of this young man, he's, he's a Christian. And I remember hearing the stories about war and just different things he would tell us. And we just, we were like, I've never experienced that. Never been in a war. Not a physical earthly war like he was in. Been in spiritual warfare. But I remember, I remember a point that he made about life being all about spiritual warfare. And he he's basically was saying, make sure you don't lose more than just an arm or a leg. You could lose your soul. A Christian soldier said that to me. So until we understand the seriousness of it all, until we truly believe it, we'll continue to live like it's peacetime. More concerned about our own comforts and securities than souls. If your child was a soldier at war in the Ukraine, would you be praying? James talks about joining the military sometimes. If your child was away at war, how would you pray then? And you heard that they were losing and a lot of people were dying and a lot of soldiers dying. How would you pray then? I can't say it enough. There are souls at stake in this community. There are souls at stake in our, all around us in our immediate surroundings, in Warren County. Let's start there. Let's start in the immediate area. When we go to basketball games, we've all got uh, kids in, in school, right? We got some Providence cards. And don't, don't just, in, inviting people to church is great. But when you can sit down and have a gospel conversation with them, right? Yeah, we'd like people to come to our church, but the most important thing, when you put it in perspective, is that they hear and receive the gospel. That they're a sinner and that Christ died to save sinners. And by faith in Christ alone and what he's done for us alone on the cross, his life, death, and resurrection, faith in that is what saves. You can't add anything to it. You can't take anything away from it. It's all about Jesus. That's what people need to hear. A lot of us live like it's at, at peacetime. There's no urgency. Make no mistake about it. The enemy is after your children and our families. What's that saying you always say, honey, about it has to do with the word pray 
If you're not praying for your children, the enemy will pray on your children. Is that? Um, yeah. We don't pray for our children as much as the enemy prays on our children. Yeah. <laughs> that is a very true statement. So here's the connection between prayer and spiritual warfare. Finally, be strong. This is Ephesians 6, 10 through 12. Finally, be strong in the Lord. It's not saying to fight on your own by yourself. Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. And also for me, that words may be given to me and opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Look at this again. Praying at all times. Praying at all times. And we know that praying at all times doesn't mean if you're driving and you need to pray, you close your eyes and... That's not good. That's not what it's talking about here. A lot of times when one of you walks up to me before you even, re and I'm not saying this to impress anybody. I'm just trying to do what scripture's telling me to do. And it's a fight for me. Don't put me up on some pedestal. Okay. I try to pray as soon as I see someone coming in. When you, when I'm here and I see you, or I see your picture on social media. I'll use Chelsea as an example. I see a picture on social media. She'll post something. God, thank you for Chelsea and her family. Be with them. As soon as you're coming to me. To talk to me or greet me. Right? Lily comes up to say hi. Hi. Already I'm thinking, Lord, please be with Lily, be with her mom and dad. I'm not saying it out loud. Praying at all times. You know, it's a fight to pray. Is it not? I'm going to be totally transparent with you. Every morning when I wake up, I, I desperately try to be God to be the first one I talk to. Father, thank you for another day. Thank you for all that you are and for who you are. Thank you for loving me. And then my mind will start to wander. Who's with me? Yeah. Who's with me? Yeah. And your mind starts to wander, right? You start thinking about what your day is going to be like, what work's going to be like if your kids have anything going on and all kinds of other things. You know how many times I got to pray? God help me to stay focused so I can pray? Every time. Just about every time I pray. Glean that wisdom from today, okay? Are y'all listening? If you're having a hard time praying, ask God to help. God help me focus. Right? We act like he's not there to help us in all things. He's there to help us in this fight, in this war. It's a fight to pray. Look at this. Remember this? 
And he, which is Jesus, came to the disciples and found them sleeping. He's in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's about to die the most horrific death ever for you and me. And he's there with his friends and he says, we pray. We just stay awake for an hour and pray with me, pray for me. And he comes back and finds him sleeping. And he says, so could you not watch with me for one hour? It's a struggle to pray. He goes on to say, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is what? The flesh is weak. Here's another connection. We're almost done, guys. Here's another connection between prayer and missions. And you'll see it in John 15, 16. It says here, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the father in my name, he may give it to you. We've been talking about this for weeks. God chooses us. We don't choose God, right? We've gone through scripture after scripture that backs that up. Scripture says we're so sinful and fallen, we can't even seek God out unless God reaches out to us first and does that work in us. No one comes to the Father unless the Father draws them, amen? So if you're called, right? So God chose you, God chose me. He sends us to bear fruit. Whatever you ask in his name, the father will give it. This is not name it and claim it theology. If you're asking God for a brand new Cadillac for selfish reasons, your prayers aren't gonna work. Your prayers are not gonna work. If you're on your knees in tears with a sincere and genuine heart, asking God to meet a need so you can reach someone for Christ. You think God will answer that prayer? He's gonna answer that one sooner than he will just for material things or comforts. So God's called us and he sends us and he gives us what we need in the battle. It's not name it and claim it, but it's wartime prayers that we need to be praying. Prayers for war. One pastor said this, and I couldn't agree with him more, and I want to share it with you. Prayer is not an intercom, but a walkie-talkie. Prayer is not a domestic intercom. It's a wartime walkie-talkie. Many people are trying to use prayer as a domestic intercom. They think that God is some kind of cosmic butler, right? They ring the bell. Um, I need another pillow. Or, you know, I I have some heartburn. Can you bring some Tums? And then the cosmic butler comes up and he gives you a pillow. And you know what? We pray for things like that, right? There's nothing wrong with saying, Lord, I have a headache. Please help. Or there's nothing wrong with those prayers. What I'm saying is, If that's all your prayer life is, you might want to reevaluate your prayer life. If the only time you pray is when you want something, not for the glory of God, just to ease your comfort. And again, I'm not saying it's wrong to ask God to help you through sickness or anything. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying if the only time you pray is for comfort and selfish reasons or as a last resort. I know people that don't pray at all until something bad happens in their lives. And I can't help but think, you know how prepared you could have been for this? You ever meet somebody, something bad happens in their life and they just lose it. They just lose it. They fall apart. And you can always tell the prayer warriors when life hits the fan, and that's, I hope I didn't offend anybody by saying that. When life hits the fan, 
and their life's falling apart, you can always tell who the people that are strongest in their faith is because they've been prayed up, right? They were ready for battle. And they don't freak out. They don't lose it. Jess, he's not here, found out he had cancer. You remember last week? What did Jess say? I just want God to be glorified. I just want God to get all the glory for it. If he heals me, that's great. That's what I'm praying for. If he has something else in mind for me and he's wanting to do something else, then do it. Do it. That's a soldier. Jess was in Vietnam. I don't know if you guys know that. Jess was in Vietnam. He knows all about the military. He knows all about being a good soldier. And I love my friend Jess. And from the two years I've known him now, he's a Christian soldier. He understands spiritual warfare. Prayer was meant for spiritual warfare, to call backup, to call for backup in the heat of the battle. We got to stop thinking of prayer as a domestic intercom where we ring the bell and have the butler bring us things. I need some time when all I got a headache. I need another pillow. But see, a lot of America lives that way. A lot of Christian Americans live that way. And that's why we're not seeing the growth in our, our little churches and that people aren't, they're either oblivious to the fight because they're so caught up in just the American dream or whatever. This is a fight. If this church is gonna grow, the Lord wants us to fight. Remember what I said about running away from spiritual battles last week? Remember that we talked about the armor. There's nothing covering your back. It's because you're not supposed to run. You run, you die. You run, you're an easy target for the enemy. When God saves you, he recruits you for battle. If you're saved, you're a soldier. You weren't saved so you could be a wall. That's another thing this pastor said. You weren't saved so you could be AWOL from the battle. You know what AWOL is? Where you're just missing. <laughs> like you're not there. Like you're supposed to be stationed somewhere performing a job in the military. And it's not that you're dead or anything. You just decided not to show up and nobody knows where you're at. It's like, what are they doing? Right? Prayer's not going to work unless it's used as intended. So where are we at today? Are we going to be more concerned about our comforts here at Providence in our personal lives? The Christian life is dangerous. If you're really living the Christian life, it's dangerous. You're going to be led into potentially dangerous, maybe even life-threatening situations. Your kids may be. What are you going to do? Are you gonna engage in spiritual warfare like we're supposed to? Or are you just gonna ignore that and just continue to live a fruitless life because you won't do what God's leading you to do? So we're gonna have a time of invitation. And as always during our invitation, I would really encourage you to spend this time with God in prayer. If you want to come forward, by all means, come forward and pray. Somebody one time says, you know, humbling yourself and coming forward and praying shows God that you don't care about what other people think. You're serious about what you're asking him for. It's not some gimmick. You guys know me better than that. I don't use coming to the altar as some kind of gimmick to brag later about how many people came to the altar. That's I'm mostly, mostly concerned with your heart. Where's your heart? Where's your relationship with God today? Where's mine? Right? 
If you want to come forward and pray, by all means do that. But during this time of invitation, please, please, please just respond to God in the way that he's leading you this morning. Amen. Amen. Amen.